We are so happy to have Dr. Bernard Fisher with us today. He is the Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Pittsburgh and an honorary member of the AACR. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. You've just become an AACR honorary member and you've won hundreds of awards and recognitions throughout your career. Let's start at the beginning. How did you get into the field? Well, that's an interesting subject and I presume you mean by the field breast cancer research. Serendipity has really played a large role in my career. Uh, when I graduated medical school in 1943, I decided that becoming a surgeon would be the thing to do because that was where so much of the drama of medicine existed at that time. But I soon learned that most surgeons were more occupied with their feats of skill and daring in the operating room than they were in understanding the biology of the disease that they were treating. So uh, that discovery led me to Surgical Research Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania in 1950, where I conducted laboratory investigations related to liver regeneration. But at that time, surgeons were removing large sections of the liver for the treatment of cancer, without knowing when, how, and whether the liver would regenerate. While conducting that research, I was invited to come create my own laboratory of surgical research at the University of Pittsburgh. So I went back to Pittsburgh, and there I continued to, my studying of liver regeneration, and I also began to do studies in transplantation and hypothermia, and a whole bunch of things. I, I just couldn't get enough of doing all these things. But while consumed with those efforts, I received a very unexpected telephone call in 1957, and I was invited to attend the NIH to participate in the planning of a clinical trial to find out whether the administration of some homeopathic dose of drug given during radical breast removal and for two days after could destroy tumor cells that were dislodged by surgeons during operation. Well, at that time, I, it was considered that this was the reason why so many women with breast cancer were not cured despite the radical surgery that was being carried out. In other words, it was the klutzy surgeons doing the operation that killed the women. Although I had no interest in breast cancer at that time, none whatsoever, I reluctantly attended the meeting, which precipitously changed my research interests. As a result, I realized how little was known from the biological aspects of breast cancer and tumor metastases in particular. I also began to realize that the foundations of medical care must be based on science and not only on the, and not on the findings of inductivism and empiricism and observations that governed the therapeutic decision making at that time. Well, as a consequence of that meeting, I spent the next 25 years doing laboratory research related to biology of tumor metastasis. And as a result of those studies, I formulated a hypothesis that was contrary to the Halsteadian concepts that governed cancer surgery for almost a century. Well, after the value of my hypothesis was supported by the means of randomized clinical trials, in 1968, there resulted for the first time, as a result of my work, a scientific basis for the surgical treatment of breast cancer and for the treatment of all kinds of other solid tumors. Well, another consequence of that meeting was that I became a founding member of what subsequently became the National Surgical Adjuvant Bre Breast Project, the NSABP. And it was chairman, I was chairman of that group for almost 30 years. I designed, initiated, and conducted many, many, actually 23 breast cancer clinical trials involving about 50,000 
breast cancer patients. And I viewed those hypothesis testing activities as really an extension of what I had been doing in the laboratory. And I think that really summarizes it was a long, painful process, but I got there. <laughs> what are the accomplishments that you are most proud of in your career? Well, I, I, I'm very, first of all, I'm proud of the fact that I'm here today. <laughs> And uh, without a doubt, uh, that which the, the honors that have been bestowed upon me at this meeting uh, to celebrate my 50 years of membership in the AACR by becoming an honorary member as a result of the research accomplishments is extremely rewarding, particularly in view of the fact that my name has been added to the list of those distinguished scientists who have preceded me in that, uh, in receiving that honor. Um, I, I'm pleased to have been recognized for having broken the shackles of Hall study and teachings that dictated the treatment of breast cancer for almost a hundred years and to have been instrumental in incorporating the role of science into the evolution of treatment of breast cancer and of other cancers as well. As a result, therapeutic decision-making and treatment are now the product of scientific investigation. And finally, I consider myself fortunate to be one of the few individuals who really had the opportunity to conduct years of laboratory research formulate a hypothesis, and from those efforts, obtain information from the use of clinical trials to support the worth of what I had been preaching. And I think that about sums it up. You are the pioneer in refuting long-held theories in tumor metastasis and the roles of surgery and post-operative chemotherapy. You are a surgeon advocating less surgery. What was it like to go against the grain? Well, each time my investigations uh, produced findings that contradicted the prevailing paradigm, my work was challenged in many different ways and not, not often very gently. When the lumpectomy trial that I designed and conducted was implemented, it certainly wasn't popular. For 50 years, surgeons had been trying to do these radical, really radical mutilating operations, and they felt that by me doing what I'm doing, just taking the tumor out and leaving the breast behind, that that was totally inappropriate. Uh, at that particular time, my, my peers were really my antagonists. The public didn't really participate in those controversies. It was difficult to convince doctors to enter patients into trials, and it was more difficult to persuade women to be randomized to a study in which they would or would not, in which they would have their breasts preserved. At first, I was dismayed by the negative reactions to my work, but with the passage of time, I accepted those, that circumstance, and I rationalized the fact that I was being challenged, often not kindly, meant that I was, must be doing something worthwhile because otherwise they wouldn't have bothered me. And to find that I'm still being criticized indicates more conclusively, to me at least, that this was the case. As a result of your research, Potentially, millions of women have been saved from disfiguring radical mastectomies. Do you ever hear from any of these women, and what is that like? Do they know the role that you have played in this paradigm shift? Well, from time to time, I did receive from women and their family members letters of gratitude and frequently contributions, not often big ones, to my research. I was very pleased, but more importantly, I was and continued to be grateful for the women with, who consented to participate in my studies of clinical trials, and they're the real heroes of all of that. 
Uh, the findings from those trials resulted in improved treatment for women who participated and ultimately for all women. I, although there's been vast information in both the lay and medical literature about breast cancer, my work has rarely been noted in the media. And that circumstance was never a problem to me because my greatest satisfaction was derived from what I accomplished through my research and not from media attention. Your work didn't only affect breast cancer, but it also affected other cancers as well. Could you discuss this? Yeah, that's a, an interesting point, which I don't think most people appreciate. And that is that um, mutilating radical and super radical surgical procedures were being performed not only by bre for breast cancer, but also for melanoma, colorectal cancer, soft, soft tissue sarcomas, head and neck cancer, and lung cancer. And just as surgery for breast cancer was based on Halsteadian principles, which dictated the, their treatment, um, my efforts, uh, as a result of my efforts, no longer or extremely rarely do we encounter patients who have had, for example, lower jaws removed, the so-called Mutton Jeff operation, or radical de de neck dissections, or hemicorporectomy. In my day, uh, when I was training as a surgeon, these things were being done where in certain hospitals in New York, they were actually cutting people in half and throwing away the, one of the halves. And abdominal perineal resections, total removal of lung, and so on and so forth. Well, as a result of my investigations, the Halsteadian thesis that removing one more cancer cell would improve the survival of more patients um, was supplanted by the treatments of many cancers in a minor sort of way when you relate it to what was being done. And those most mutilating operations, I think, are really historic landmarks for indicating the progress that has been made in the treatment of cancer. Um, so what are your thoughts on the new, less invasive surgical techniques? What are they doing right and what are they doing wrong in your estimation? And where do you see this field going? Well, in a prior article which appeared in, the, in an issue of cancer research that I, it was published to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the AACR, I reviewed the role of biological research in the evolution of cancer surgery. And I concluded the article by remarking that it is, quote, that it is ultimately the findings from research in molecular biology and genetics that will dictate the future sta status of treatment. And it's almost certain that cancer surgery will be supplanted by other modalities and particularly by preventive measures that have evolved as a result of scientific investigation. Dr. Fisher, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.